The year 2021 might have been better than 2020, although for some, the verdict is still in doubt. We're now in 2022, and we have to wonder, what have we learned during the pandemic? And today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Paul Meachin, the former head of safety at CDC and now a member of the GBAC Scientific Advisory Board, and of course, Patty Ollinger, the executive director of GBAC. So before we get into our discussion today, we do have a 30-second message from our sponsor, Breezy, and then we'll get right into it. It's time now. It's great to partner with UNM Athletics and help keep such an iconic arena safe for fans, players, and coaches as they all experience the magic of the pit. We know how special this building is to our program. We want you to be at every single game, making this the toughest place to play in all of college basketball. Well, we want you here safely. And thanks to Breezy, they're making sure that this environment is clean the right way. So Paul and Patty, uh, let's talk about, let's cover four points today in our discussion. The first one is about 2021. You know, we went into 2021 thinking it's going to be a great year, 2020, put it behind us, move on. So tell us in your, your opinion, your thoughts, what went well and what did not go so well in 2021. And Patty, do you want to start us off? Sure. Sure, Jeff. Um, you know, we all, I think, are getting to the point, and I think this is one of the things that isn't going as well as we want, and that is we're all tired. Everybody. It doesn't matter who we, who it is. We're tired of this pandemic. We're wanting to get back to what, a normal life of whatever that may be without restrictions, or at least with the ability to move forward in our businesses and with our families and our social events, with our, our kids. Um, that that's something that I think that what we call pandemic fatigue, we're seeing lacks of the behaviors that we know need to be put in place. And that that's something that we're seeing, I guess, if you want to call it a failure, um, is that the other for me is the messaging, the messaging that we're seeing that we didn't do very well on is confusing for a lot of people. And I know Paul has a lot of thoughts on that. Um, what we've done well is that we have identified a lot of ways to be able to mitigate or at least put in place um, the necessary steps or the necessary behaviors to be able to do what, what we want to do. It's just now having the discipline to do it. Well, Paul, she said you had a lot of thoughts. So let's hear a couple of them. I, I do. I think our biggest failure was how we communicate. And the problem is that science doesn't work by proving something's true. It proves something's false. And so we'd have a theory that, that we thought was going to be true. Uh, the first wave, first waves of, the, of COVID. And we thought when we got past that in the spring of last year that we were pretty well past the, the, the pandemic. And then came Delta and now Omicron. We weren't thinking that the mutants would be able to take over. And that was a failure of us to be able to say, look, this may only be halftime. This may not be the end of the game. And I think that was a real missed opportunity for us to reorganize and essentially strengthen our defenses when we had a, a, a lull in the infection rate. What I think we did well is exactly what Patty was talking about. We learned about multiple strategies, all of which provide us some protection. But I think, again, the failure is we're becoming fatigued. We're becoming tired. We, we had that relaxation this summer. We loved it. We enjoyed it. And, and we deserved it. But fall came, Delta, Omicron, and we got tired. And with Omicron, we actually have to change. We have to adapt to its, its behavior, its strengths. And it is stronger. It is more infectious. And so where we were doing six feet in 15 minutes and we had all these times and all these things set up, Omicron's far more infectious at shorter times and at less, less of a dose. And so we have to adapt. And we're not, a, not, not only are we not adapting, we're pulling back from the things that we were doing okay early in the year. And I think that's going to be our biggest fight is to take on that sort of fatigue and, and beat it back. So I think you might both agree that we're learning a lot, 
but keep keep keeping up the fight and implementing what we learn. Maybe that's the the fatigue we're seeing, the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's get into the science and offer some advice to our audience today. Uh, let's talk about the layered approach when we think about all types of cleaning, hand hygiene, and air purification. Sure. And, you know, um, and, and Jeff, you know, I, I wrote an article actually for you um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with regard to, you know, the virus doesn't care and that, uh, and it never will. Uh, in fact, it's, it, it's, it's wanting to survive. Um, if it was an, if it was alive, it would be looking for how it survives. Uh, but that there are mitigation, I, we call them mitigation strategies. There's strategies and there's things that we can do to put in place to help, you know, get through this and get through. And for me, those layered are get vaccinated. We know the vaccine is safe. We know that it's effective. We know that it protects from serious illness and death. Um, wear a mask when you're in, especially when you're in public areas where there's a lot of people and you're going out in public or you don't know the status of, of individuals. Masks do matter. Um, Paul and I could get into a whole debate on masks versus face coverings versus respirators and legitimate, legitimate discussion, but masks do matter. Um, hand hygiene, wash your hands. There's a reason for it. <laughs> Um, don't touch your face, basically, uh, take into consideration the indoor air quality. Um, if you're, if you have the ability, if you cannot change, especially if you're a business owner, the HVAC system and the systems in there, think about portable indoor air quality filtration devices. They are important and we know that they work. Um, you know, distancing, you know, if you if I'm going to really, if I'm in line, you know, how many times do we not get real close to somebody nowadays? You know, we know that that's a, an issue. Um, and then surfaces, people, you know, this is, I think, a mistake. We made a mistake as, as an industry, basically, as far as um, saying surfaces don't matter. And if you really read the guidelines, it, it said routine, but they never really defined routine. Cleaning and sanitization are important. You know, routine means that we have to do it right. And surfaces do matter. And especially those high touch points. If someone coughs and they, you know, rub their nose and they touch a, a door handle and you're right behind them, that virus is still viable. And if you then touch that surface and touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, you have the potential of becoming infected. Maybe not at the infectious rate as an airborne, somebody coughing in your face, but you still have that potential. And I, I think it was a mistake that we discounted the surface um, importance um, early on from, uh, we didn't, but I know that, that some people out there trying to get people to focus on, on those really high, high importance. Be educated, things like this, um, making sure that you understand um, you know, different programs like our awareness program or other things that are out there available, get your employees aware of things and then get tested. <laughs> I know that's controversial today um, because we can't get the tests, but if you're going to be, you know, with grandma and, you know, or, you know, to protect them, get tested before you go and, and, and congregate. Well, I personally vote no to all germs, but I don't know if that matters. So <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to get rid of them as we can from surfaces and from the air. Uh, Paul, what do you think? Maybe from your, uh, exper your expertise with the CDC. So there were a couple of things that Patty said that I kind of want to massage just a bit. And I, I love the idea that you're talking about disinfecting the high touch surfaces. I think that we've got away. We, we kind of got muddled early on in that we were disinfecting everything. And it got to it, that it drove the fatigue. But I don't think I talk about the term routine. I'd use the word frequent because routine could be once a day. Well, somebody coughs on it and it's now 23 hours and 59 minutes until the next cleaning. That doesn't do me any good. It's identifying those key surfaces, elevator buttons, handrails, door pulls 
keypads at your favorite shopping center, your, your grocery store. The more you can do stuff that is contactless, that you're not doing the touching, the better. We're still there. We're still in that, that area where if you, should, you aren't needing to touch something, don't. It's not your interest. Because we have gone away from that frequent cleaning and gone to routine. But routine is not routine, is not frequent enough. It you, needs you, to be frequent. That's, and it's that's, a really good, that's a great point, you know, and, and, you know, and I've read in international documents and our own, our own um, governmental documents here in the United States, that word routine cleaning. And it drives me crazy because for when they, when people read that, they don't really understand that routine cleaning doesn't mean you spray a surface and immediately wipe. It means that you may be routinely, like you said, the frequency needs to be taken into consideration, but that you need to do it right. You need to know what you're using. You know, have you read the label? Is the dwell time that you're going to be using correct? And, you know, you don't use the same cloth all day long on all surfaces. So, I mean, routine cleaning, that's one of the things that we need to define for people because it's not difficult, but it does is something that people need to understand. Mm -hmm. Good information. Another topic I want to get into is um, a statement by Dr. Maria Van Kirkhoff. She's the COVID-19 technical lead for the World Health Organization. Um, now we know experts say that this Omicron variant won't be the last to, to come up. And in fact, in today's news, Patty, I know you shared with me in a text that there's something in France that we're watching. So who knows? But the point is, uh, she said recently in a newscast that we can come out of this pandemic this year, 2022. Now, I know you're not uh, able to predict the future, but what are your thoughts on that? If someone says this is the last year, 23, we have no more COVID, what would you say, Patty? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where on one hand, um, I guess I, no pun intended on that, uh, but you know, we heard that at the beginning of 2021 as well. And I think that that's something that we need to take into consideration is we don't know. I hope so. I hope that by the end of 2022, we really are out of this, uh, but we don't know. And that's the being prepared for what's next. I have to agree with Patty on that. And that it, our crystal balls, they have uniformly been wrong. We thought we'd get through the first wave and then Delta showed up. We thought, oh, that's the worst it could possibly be. And now comes Omicron. Do we know what's next? No, we have no idea. And as it stands right now, we still don't know enough about Delta or Omicron to make predictions about where it's going. So to say that we know what's going next is blind faith. And if COVID's taught us anything, it's not to trust that blind faith. We need to maintain vigilance until it literally does drop off towards zero. And remember, in, in the United States, Canada, the, in Western Europe, our vaccination rates are pretty good. But there are 7 billion people on the planet. And most of them are not vaccinated. And they form a huge reservoir for new mutations to take place. And, and when we talk about COVID, we were talking before, it's about the fitness of that virus. Is it more fit than Omicron? Then it will take over and become the next wave. And we have no way of predicting that yet. When we compare Omicron to Delta, we look at mutations, changes in its genetic structure. And we say, well, we didn't expect that. We didn't expect that either. We didn't expect that one either. But they're there. And they have caused changes in its success rate that we didn't predict. And so I don't think we should go out on a limb and say, oh, yes, this is it. And in 22, it'll be over. Oh. Back to the communication. Got to be careful on what we say. Yeah, you know those crystal those those um, crystal balls. You got to plug them in. Did you know that? No, I <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. I knew there was an issue. Okay, we'll talk. Let's after the, we're done with this webcast, we'll talk. <laughs> All right. So serious to get back to serious topics here. My last point is about how some feel about Omicron. You know, when you think about the news and how it's thankfully not killing as many people as Delta. Some have been saying, well, it's just like the common cold. You get it, runny nose, whatever symptoms you have, it goes away. 
could that make us a little less um, vigilant? And what do you think? Oh, from, from my perspective, yes, I think that that is. It's just mild. It's a mild case. I mean, Paul and I have heard for years, it's like, well, it has flu-like symptoms. Well, um, and Paul and I worked together um, uh, when I was at uh, down in Atlanta um, on, when we had Ebola patients. Um, and it was like, what did you say? Well, it has flu-like symptoms. Yeah, in the beginning. Um, and so when we hear that it's mild and it's cold-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms, people are like, oh, okay, well, it's not that bad. The problem is, is it's still circulating and people at an alarming rate are getting sick with it. And when people get sick with it, our healthcare workers, for example, they get taken out of the workforce. And so you see the stress on healthcare, which is already there. Now it's because they're getting sick. Um, people's kids are getting sick. They come home, they get sick. So it is a domino effect. And, it, and so it is still an issue um, right now. And it's it, absolutely true. But I want to make one point clear that people are doing the right thing. They are staying home. This is what we should have been doing for years with influenza. If you are sick, stay home and we can break the back of these or at least lower the curves. For, for these. The problem with Omicron is it is so infectious that the numbers have just skyrocketed. And so where you might see all of these illnesses in a normal flu winter, we're seeing them in a space of weeks. And so it's a, it's a huge impact, a dramatic impact on our healthcare systems, on our transportation systems in a very short period of time. And that's what's causing a huge amount of stress. And, and the other part going to it is back to highly infectious, but low risk of going to the hospital, when you multiply those numbers together, it's still a big number. And so the people that end up in the hospital, still a lot, they're still overwhelming the system, even though your individual odds aren't very great. So no, it's really not the flu and no, it's not taking place over the six months of a normal flu season. So don't think of it that way. 